Okay, so we can continue the discussion about uh, last class uh, in which uh, we started analyzing what do we mean with the ambient intelligence. And uh, we ended up with this uh, sort of flow of information that includes these four main moments that now we will analyze uh, one by one in more detail. So just to recap, uh, uh, emitting intelligence requires being able to sense the environment, so having some sensors, some way to connect them, some way of analyzing the data coming from the sensors, and, and the taking decisions on top of the data collected and on top of the information that we have. And finally, these decisions should be turned into some concrete act and action onto the environment or onto the devices present in the environment. And all of these uh, interacting with the user, because the user is actually the one that causes the change in the environment that will be sensed, and the one who will be, who will be perceiving the actions that we do on the environment. So if the user moves, then the light changes, for example, the user changes some information about the sensors, and the system will change some status on the light, some color, some intensity level or whatever, and the user will feel that, okay? So these are the main four elements that are continuously looping in an ambient intelligence system. Sensing is a very wide topic and area. There are sensors for everything, nearly, eh? or actually for everything depends on the, on the cost, actually. Uh, you may speak about a single sensor, so one device, or more often a sensor network. So a set of different sensors deployed, installed the, in various points and locations in the environment that are connected through a network, that a dedicated network that is used for collecting the data, for getting data from the sensor to some centralized point to uh, compute or store or analyze the collected data. Uh, sensors may be independent. A single device, like for example that item up there in, on the ceiling, is a smoke sensor. It's a device with a specific function that is connected through some wires to a central control unit somewhere that analyzes all the information for all the smoke detection sensors that will give information whether there's a fire starting up in this room or not, okay? That couple of devices are also independent sensors, independent individuals, so that they do that specific function. They are there to measure the temperature of this room. So there are thermos, thermometers sensors. They get the temperature in this room that can be used, that will be used to control the heating and the air conditioning in the room itself, okay? But in many other cases, sensors can also be embedded. So uh, if you have a smartphone in your pocket, it will track your movement with the accelerometer, it will track your position with the GPS and the compass, and uh, will measure the um, intens light intensity level in the environment. Uh, it has some cameras, some micros microphones, and so on. So this is an example of one device with a specific function, but that embeds a lot of individual sensors. The ambient intelligence system may gather information from the, let's say, specific ad hoc sensors or from sensors embedded in other devices. Okay, it's all information that we may get. And uh, these sensors may be installed in a various point, may be installed deployed in the environment, like those that we mentioned before, or on the body of the person. So something that the person, that the user carries with them. This uh, it may be a device, but even this microphone, it's a sensor that I'm currently carrying on my body. So if I move, the sensor moves with me. Okay, this is not part of an emit intelligence in this specific case, but uh, uh, the, so you have this, let's say, various possibilities for how to sense a value, 
how to sensor value? Do I sense it through a sensor or do we have, do we have a, a more complex device with sensors inside? The sensors is connected through a wired connection with wires like those or in a wireless connection. Uh, that do we, is it better to put that into the environment or on top of the person? Uh, in this table, you just have some, some examples of uh, quantities, physical quantities, that may be measured by different types of sensors. So um, we won't read the list, uh, but it gives you a, a, an idea of the type of sensing and the uh, uses. We can also go beyond what we usually see or use. For example, you may have something that, well, in your, if you have a, a car, for example, there are newer models of the car that are able to sense whether some person is sitting in the, uh, in the car seats. And uh, this information is used to activate or deactivate the airbags that will not be deployed if nobody is sitting. And it also we use for nagging the user if he's not wearing the, the security belt. Okay, bing, bing, bing. And uh, so it's a, a type of pressure sensor that is used to sense a weight, whether a weight is present or not. Okay, so it, it will not be able to sense whether you are sitting or you are putting a bag uh, on, on, the, on the seat, no? because it only senses the weight. So it's not a, a people sensor, but it's a weight sensor in some way that can be used to detect people. So uh, we also start uh, thinking about uh, what we want to measure from uh, what we actually measure. We want to measure where, whether a person is sitting, but actually we can measure whether a weight, alive or dead, or an object, or a, or a dog, is positioned on the seat. So we are not sensing the person, we are sensing weight. We may use this information for estimating whether actually the person will be sitting. So there, there is always a step of estimation, of, of guessing, of error in interpreting the value of a sensor. The sensor gives you a number. Okay, 32.7 kilograms. How do you interpret this number? Is 32 kilograms enough for a person? Maybe for a baby? It's up to us to interpret the sensor, okay? So, uh, and we, it's a, s a separate issue from the sensing itself. Okay, here I just try to put up some example of sensors. I just uh, browsed the internet and found one manufacturer of sensors. These are, in particular, wireless devices. So they go on batteries. And you can deploy them in different parts in the environment. Only one manufacturer has this whole set of different sensors to be deployed in the ambient. But there, there are, if you take maybe there are hundreds of different manufacturers, each with their own long list of different uh, sensors that may be may, you know, the, the opening of, the, of a door or a drawer, uh, carbon dioxide uh, measurements, uh, anything you want. Uh, sound and light, uh, so whether there is some sound in, in an ambient or not, the temperature, uh, Anything actually, huh? whether you are using an or, or a door or something like that. So anything you want, there, there is a device for that, very likely. And also there is a new, and it's actually a current wave of body sensors. Sensors that they call them wearable sensors or wearable devices. Devices that you can carry with you, on, on you actually, you can wear them in many cases, and then can measure, well, they can measure quantities about yourself or about the environment in which you are. And there are very famous those for, for example, uh, sports. You can, they, they can track your activity and your sleep patterns, whether you're sleeping well, whether you're running enough, whether you're burning enough calories and whatever. Uh, this one is for medical uh, purposes. So it's to be put into the cloth is very small, for example, this one. And uh, uh, it can be put on, on your skin and it measures some uh, quanti medical quantities about your skin, about your movement, about your health. Uh, and this information can be interpreted by some uh, medical persons. This one 
it's, it's also very small. I just took some examples, but uh, to give an idea of how wide this area is. A uh, very small device to be woven or inserted into the cloth, into your sports or running cloth. Uh, and so it gives you the movement and the kilometers that you do and something like that. This one is a watch-like device that actually senses the, your heart rate uh, and some other, let's say, uh, health-related uh, quantities. And then, okay, the more famous you may have the, the Google glasses or glass-like. So they are devices that usually can, they have some means to be attached to the, to the person. So whether they go into the clothes, whether they go into your pockets, whether you wear them as a bracelet or, a, or as a pair of glasses, there are not many other, but some, some are, are, are bound to the shoes. For example, the Nike sensor is bound to the, your uh, shoelaces, and so on. There are some ways of attaching them to the person, and then they can measure, depending on the position they have and the goal they have, they can measure different stuff. Um, I call them Google Classes also sensors because they have accelerometers inside, they have cameras, they have microphones, so they can sense the environment. They can do some, much more, but they also have embedded sensors. And this one, maybe you don't know it, but it's a very nice device. It's an EEG reader, so something that you wear in your head and it can read your brain patterns. And uh, it cannot read your thoughts, of course, you cannot read your mind, but with some training, for example, you can play video games with that instead of controlling. So instead of the, okay, there's the Wii controller, there's a lot, many other stuff that you are on your body. For, you see the applications, medical application, sports application, uh, gaming application, entertainment, uh, there are, these are the fields mainly where these body wearable sensors are expanding. And these sensors are very nice, uh, but they generate a lot of data. Okay, <laughs> we want them to generate a lot of data. We put them uh, in, for generating data in the first place. But uh, you need them to make sense of that data. Because having very, you know, filling terabytes of sensor data is easy. Understanding what this data actually means. So we may have uh, sensors about uh, carbon dioxide, temperature, humidity, luminosity, or whatever in this room, maybe in the four different corners or whatever. But then the question is, are you comfortable in the room? That's the information. Is the climate condition in the room okay or not? So you, you have a lot of information, but you need to some make sense out of that. And it's not easy because these data tend to, to be very huge. So the big data uh, techniques are often needed to analyze these very large sets of data. The individual values, the single value, the single numbers are usually meaningless. One single value. You need to see them as a whole. You need to see the patterns. You need to compare today with yesterday this side of the room with the other side of the room to understand something. Uh, the, the raw data, plotting the raw data makes no sense, gives no information access. These data are also tend, tend to be very noisy. So these sensors are not very precise. Uh, if you have, okay, I have a very, very fine accelerometer that allows me to play dry, driving games. But if the same accelerometer is used to measure this probably will go out of range, will not be measuring a real data. So there's a noise in that. Low cost, you know, you want, of course, sensors to be very low cost. And, uh, and so they will have a, a very low precision. That. So that data is there, but you must be aware that it's very noisy. It means that the actual value is, uh, let's say, modified by some amount of error that we don't know that we cannot. Missing points is the norm. Okay, something may run out of battery, something may run out of range. Oh, there was uh, some period in which I was recording the, 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 the lectures, the classes with a Bluetooth microphone. Okay, okay, fine, the, the computer is connected via Bluetooth with a microphone, very lighter than this stuff. But then when I walked three steps in one direction, it went out of range. So I had holes in the, holes in the, in the recording. 
so it may go out of range, go out of battery, may have some radio problem, interference problem, anything. There may be periods, something may break up. When you have hundreds of sensors in an, an environment, there will be always one or two of them broken. Always. Reliability, if you count the medium, the, the medium time between failures of any device, you multiply by hundreds of thousands, you will find out that every day there will be something breaking up, or every week, okay? So it's normal, you need to take that, it's not the exception, it's the norm. So you need to find data processing methods that, okay, take into account this. Measures, measures are heterogeneous. Okay, I, I may have the temperature, which is something uh, Kelvin degrees. I may have humidity, which is a percentage. I may have uh, um, CO2 measures, which is, uh, I don't know whether it's in milligram per, uh, per cubic meter or some other uh, uh, unit of measure. I may have uh, some uh, air pollution measure, which is in the uh, number of uh, parts per million of uh, PM10, PM20, different uh, types of... Uh, so they're even not easy to, to put together these numbers. They have different physical natural physical interpretations, so you cannot put just all of them, plot them in a single chart uh, to be. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't make sense from the, from the physical point of view. And, uh, okay, time and space dependent, uh, of course, having a temperature of uh, uh, 35 degrees at, mid, at midday in July here is normal. We don't like it, but it would be normal. Having 35 degrees, at midnight in January would be not very, uh, it would be strange, probably there would be something on fire, okay? Uh, so the interpretation of a measure depends on the time. Time, day, hour, season, and on the space and the position, if especially it's a moving sensor, some sensor on the body of a person, the location of this person changes the interpretation we do to the data. So. Um, usually sensor generates this, what we call the raw data, but very soon we want to process this data in some way. So to filter them, to um, compensate for the holes, uh, to filter out the noise and something like that. Okay, so we should al always understand whether we are working with the raw data or with data that has, has undergone some kind of uh, processing already. And this processing usually tends to be real-time processes in some way, maybe done on the sensor, maybe done on the controller that controls the sensor, maybe done offline in the data center. There are many solutions depending on what we want to achieve. So the sensor issue is very complex. It's a lot of technology, both software and hardware for that. The reasoning part is even harder. Actually, what I would say that uh, for the sensing, we, are, we already have a lot of solutions and of products that are working. You can deploy them, they can work well or less well, but we have them. For the reasoning part, uh, we, are, we, are, we are not yet at this point. Uh, we have some prototypes, some examples, some research centers, some results uh, where some intelligent prototype is able to work with a, usually with a limited environment. In a specific case, it works but something that can be able to reason in general in an open context, you put that into your house and in mine and they both work, uh, we are not yet there. So there are no solution for that. What we need to do? We need to, okay, a reasoning is needed uh, to provide, for example, the adaptability that we asked for. Let's say, let's say uh, an intelligent system is a system that adapts itself to my needs. And for adapting, it must have a brain in some way, even maybe simple, but it must have some reasoning part. It must be able to interpret and recognize the context. So, uh, for example, time and space are a context. The user is a context information, something that I have some data, but I interpret this data in different ways, depending on, depending on the time, depending on the user, depending on the habits of the user, depending on whether the user is alone, or there are other people with them, and so on. So it's all information that is not, uh, that is needed to influence the choice. 
and which is not, uh, we call them context because usually it's not explicit information. It's something that we need to gather from uh, other sources and put together and, and understand. So context detection is an issue. Hmm? Context detection means understanding a context. Context awareness means uh, taking decision, decision depending on the current context. Hmm? Um, and I would just stop on the last point about acting versus suggesting. We say that uh, an, an, an MEI system, an ambient intelligence system, is able to act. Then it's an, it's an interaction issue mainly, whether it should act or it should ask the user whether to act. So if I'm controlling the temperature in this house, of course, it should act immediately. If the system understands that the temperature is too high, it should lower the temperature by some means. But if, for example, uh, the system would like to switch the lights off or on, maybe it should not do it immediately, but it should ask for the user permission. So it would be very bad for the users, and this is uh, one of the of the dangers of ambient intelligence for the users to feel captive, captured into an environment, to feel prisoners. I am in a house and the house does whatever it, it wants and I, I'm not in control. Okay, the user should always feel in control. Maybe it, you don't want, not necessarily it is, it is in control. Maybe it's not in direct control, but it feels so. Again, I take an example from the automotive sector. If you have a modern car, okay, when you push your, uh, your foot uh, in, on, the, on the throttle, on the gas, huh, you imagine that what you studied at school, it will open, the, um, the, the, it will regulate the, the quantity of, uh, of fuel which is injected into the engine. Okay, so you, you are, we are imagining a proportional. I'm push, I'm, I'm, I'm throttling more, and so some will be more, there will be more fuel to the engine. Or I'm braking stronger, and so the brakes will, but actually it's not like this. Between the, our throttle pedal and the engine, there is an electronic system that decides how much fuel to give depending on the condition, the temperature of the temperature of the motor, the condition and so on, and the command of the user. This is what gives, of course, the control of the emissions. So you, you will never be able to put full gas and have a, full, a, lot, a lot of fuel at the same time and lower and we, that will not be burnt. So the, the, the system will prevent that. So you, but you, you, don't, you don't feel that. You feel that when you push, the car goes. Because there's a good control system that is able to control the system, this, the electronics in your car is in control, but it makes you feel you are in control. Okay, it's very difficult. It's very fine. It's very uh, difficult to, to go uh, whether or to have too little control, so everything on the user, so you are not doing anything intelligent, or trying to do too much, and then the user would feel strange. You feel that when you're, when maybe they are, again, talking about the cars when you use the anti-braking system. If you try to brake on the ice, you, you see that the, the engine, that the, the, the brakes are refusing to brake. They don't. And so you say, this is strange. No? It's, it's not normal. You feel it. You don't like it. If it would happen every, every time, you would be very anxious when driving. Okay? You know that it's for security issues, and so you trust it. But your feeling is not of uh, that, or, uh, you are feeling not to be in control, and this is not like it, this is comforting in a way. Okay, so this is something that the intelligence of the system should not fight, fight against the intelligence of the user. Hmm? Not, very, not very easy to do. Okay, acting, acting is easy, maybe even easier than uh, um, sensing, because the type of actions is usually narrower, there are less types of actions that we can do than types of, of sensors that we may have. 
acting means uh, usually opening or closing a circuit with we, we need just a relay, then, then it depends on what this relay is connected to, or give or more or less uh, uh, voltage or current to a circuit. The bottom line is always the same. And of course, it depends on what kind of action that we do, what, what is the actuator, whether it's a, a door or an elevator or a light lamp or whatever. But the technology behind, behind the acting uh, is much simpler. Uh, I have just a couple of pictures of uh, uh, of the shell systems for home automation. So the basic uh, say technology that you can put in your house uh, when you have uh, uh, relays uh, and uh, uh, here and you have plugs, uh, you have uh, switches and buttons and so on. These are two different manufacturers uh, that are built in different incompatible systems, but uh, uh, both of them do the same thing. Can let you control your house with a lot of buttons and relays uh, and the control system which is embedded here, or uh, where is that, there, okay? Um, so you, use, you may use, uh, in many cases, uh, home automation technology for the acting part, uh, uh, light doors, windows, and so on. And also acting may also mean uh, providing information to the user. This is an action. And information to the user may be uh, some lights going on, uh, some alarm light, uh, some, uh, you know, all that uh, very ugly uh, device that you see there is, an, is a speaker, uh, speaker phone, uh, it's a, louder, a loud phone, sorry. So they use that only in case of emergency. In case of emergency, they would say, oh, there's something wrong, please go out and exit and abandon the, 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 the room or whatever. So it's a way of acting, playing a recorded message, for example. Uh, or pushing a notification to your device, or ringing your phone, or sending an SMS, or whatever. And, uh, of course, one particular case of action is uh, that mediated by robotic devices, but we are not touching them very much in this course. And the critical issue is still interacting with the user. So, the most critical issues are data handling and sensors, reasoning, which act actually is not known uh, as a solution, and uh, interaction. Uh, interaction may be in different ways. You may use the traditional uh, fixtures that you have in your home. So the, you have a button like any other button in your house, but behind that button there's not, there will not be a wire, but a microprocessor that gets the signal and uh, communicates with the, with the rest of the automation si uh, system. You may have, have explicit traditional user interfaces, web interfaces, desktop, uh, touch panels, uh, mobile devices, or whatever, which is a more indirect interaction because you are interacting with a computer that in turn gives the comments. It's less natural. Or the natural user interfaces that nowadays are very common, especially in the gaming industry, where, uh, where they can intercept your movement, your speech, speech recognition, your gestures, you are you may gesting a device, moving a device, or making gestures in plain air. There's, there are a lot of games that work like this. Uh, motion tracking, some games or some systems are already learning to understand your, whether you're happy or, or, or sad or whatever, or whether you're laughing. Hmm? And so in some way, the interaction or your comma, your interaction doesn't need to be with a computer that in turn interacts with the system. You may feel like interacting directly with your environment. If you do like this and the lights go up, for example, it will not be a very comfortable gesture, but uh, you, are, you know in some way in the back of your mind that there will be a lot of computers interpreting that. But you are not seeing them, you are not touching them, you are not, you are not feeling them. So it's uh, what they say that by in the disappearing computer, the computers are, are working best when they disappear from the life. So people are just interacting with the objects and with ambience, and they don't see the computer behind them. Hmm? That would be the, the success of the interaction. Uh, this picture is actually a, a real one taken from a house in which they try to put a very lot of home automation. I would say a bit too much. 
uh, in which uh, so it was not a very successful project, but just to say what danger you can do if you put too much technology. Uh, this picture was on the side of a door, but actually on the side of every door in that room, there was something like this. These are normal uh, fixture buttons that you find in your house, but for some way, they, they are rotated of 90 degrees. So instead of being horizontal, the three, they are, so that puts a, already a, a little bit of discomfort. Then they are of different colors, but actually the colors are meaningless. There is not a logical uh, choice of these colors. So it's a bit of information that you take a, a, take a while to learn to ignore because it's not useful. And you have one, two, three, four, five, seven, seven, nine, nine buttons in a row, in group of trees, that do different stuff. They control the, uh, the lights, the doors, the windows. Uh. So after a while, they understood that uh, people couldn't remember what every button did. And so they started to put very little labels here. This red uh, stuff, when, when you see the, the slides, you can download them. You can see that there are very icons, small icons that tell, OK, this is opening this door, or close the door, uh, control the lights, and something like that. Very heavy on the user. So the user must go there. OK, in your house, you just go and touch and light the, the door and the light, uh, switch the light on and, and then go further. You have to go, stop, look at the icons, think about what the icons mean, think about the button which is on the side of the icon and try to push it. So it will take one second or even more of thinking every time you have to do very, a small or little action. Okay, very, it's a, it's, a, it's a big failure. And by the way, some people who were, were living in this uh, uh, house for some time, at the end decided to, to use a very low tech uh, solution they put some scotch tape on, on top of some button saying, don't touch this one, okay? Or, or, they, or they just wrote uh, or colored some of, some of them, finding, say, low-tech solutions to say. But uh, actually, the, the people who, had, who tried this, this was a demo, uh, a trial environment, is not, uh, but people will try to live there for some months, uh, say, they actually felt anxious about being able, in the case of danger, or in the case of, uh, you need to uh, do something in a hurry no, of not being able, no, they were, were feeling anxious of not being able to do what they wanted. So they felt prisoners in this house. The system was working perfectly. There are no defects, technological defects. The interaction was a failure. So the system was not able to give to the user the perception of being useful but it gave the perception of being dangerous. Hmm? But, so interaction should be the most important starting point, but in many cases uh, is a bit forgotten because people concentrate on technology. Hmm? Too much technology is dangerous. Okay, uh, yeah, just have a list of, um, of other buzzwords uh, that you can hear uh, around, which more or less tend to converge on the concept of ambient intelligence. So a lot of people are talking about the Internet of Things, okay? Or the Cisco company is trying to push a concept which is different, they call Internet of Everything. Actually, it means uh, putting a network connection and some intelligence, a microprocessor, into every object and having them connected into a network. Uh, the question is to do what, of course. Huh? Uh, to do what and uh, how different objects from different manufacturers will be able to discover each, um, each other and do something useful. Uh, because what we see is that every manufacturer tends to do something which only works with their own devices, not in general. Uh, there is also an aspect of this um, which is of more of interest uh, to the telecommunication companies. So the one who builds the networks, uh, and they tend to call this machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication as opposed to, you know, your, your mobile phone, which is able to communicate with the central, with the mobile central antennas, but not between phone and phone or not spontaneously. 
Okay? So they have a hierarchical system. And now they are starting to recognize that devices and the devices need also to communicate directly one to each other. And how to communicate to give standard communication uh, frames and protocols and, uh, and so on. So there are actually different aspects, different points of view of the same thing. Uh, what we call by domotics or smart homes is actually ambient intelligence without the reasoning part. So without intelligence. Where the reasoner is very stupid, then you get just automation or smart automation or smart environment, but it doesn't show the, the, the intelligent part. It can do very uh, nice things, but it's not adaptive, it's not, uh, um, it doesn't have all the um, properties that we want. Um, Okay, so this we just have to now comment the, the definition, the main uh, flow. Now I, I want to go a bit uh, deeper or into the, 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 the characteristics of these systems. Okay, then we will let the rest of the course to learn to build them or build parts of them. But first we want, that's why we are talking about this, we are trying to, to give a big picture of what we want to achieve, what kind of system we are targeting. Where do we want, uh, do today or in the future, where do we want an ambient intelligence system or intelligent ambient to serve us? Well, the environment, uh, the term environment or ambient is very general. It may apply to homes, it may apply to buildings, there may be private buildings or public buildings. It may also apply to open spaces. Okay, you, may, you can make the... The, the, the whole outside intelligent uh, by putting sensor and something even in the open air, okay? It's always an environment. It doesn't need to be closed. Of course, in the open is more difficult for uh, mainly uh, the reliability of the devices. Uh, and the type of application is very, very, uh, very different. I, I try to, to give a, a sort of a, an overview of the main types of applications as a, as a mind map. So I try to gather in, on the left uh, the locations, so the types of places, and on the right the type of applications. So the places may be homes, we call them smart homes, uh, where you can see, for example, existing solution, OTS stands for off the shelf, so something that you can go and buy you can get smartphones, they will not be very intelligent with the, the existing solution, but the, the, the automation is already working very well. There can be new smart devices. There are the smart TV and the smart fridge and the smart washing machine. You can go, if you, uh, if you want to go to a, to, a, to a shop and see, there are a lot of appliances, for example, that are, that are called smart in some way. So they do smarter things, but mainly, in many cases, they tend not to be connected, not to be integrated with the rest. Okay. Uh, the same you can do in the office uh, from two different points of view. A smart office is a place uh, where, for example, you want to manage uh, the environment. So people, the temperature, the, the light, the energy consumption, and so on. Manage them in an efficient way, in a centralized way. Independently from, from what people are doing. Just managing the, the, the spaces. Hmm? Knowing whether there is some people inside or not, whether people are allowed to go, to cross, to go to one, one, one place or another, and so on. Or you can also target what people are doing. So the environment is always... Can be, also, can be also linked to the, tip, the type of, of task people are doing. Okay, so in that case, they become more specific, but they can allow people to be more efficient uh, in their environment, in their work. The same goes for the industry. And uh, you can always target, the, for example, uh, uh, smartness in the, in the smart industry or smart factory, as they call that some, sometimes. You can target the plant, so if you have a factory that produces something, you can make the, the machines smarter, more integrated, or integrated with the, with the building. Or can put the smarters into the product. So you put sensor or tags on the products themselves, 
or both of them. So they may have different points of view, always. Huh? And uh, some examples are also in, uh, for example, the supermarkets or say shared spaces. These are not public spaces, but are spaced, uh, spaces shared by a lot of people. And again, you can do that to have a more efficient or intelligent product handling. So understanding or knowing better whether you are going out of stock of something, for example, or to improve the customer interaction, hmm? which borders a bit with marketing, so pushing new, new sales, but doesn't need to be actually just marketing. So these are type of uh, where uh, do we find these applications? And what kind of applications? Well, uh, for example, one big area, very big area, and with strong economical importance is, for example, health. And health, uh, you may have uh, health uh, at home. So people can be, which, who, have, who have diseases, who, has, who have problems, may be tracked in some way in their home with uh, what they call the telemedicine or e-health, uh, where you are being monitored and your data is being sent to a doctor to a, or to a hospital. Or something more that we call ambient assisted living, which is uh, designing homes or apartments that may help people which have disabilities or which have some kind of illness or, which are, or are becoming, becoming elder, older and older with the age, and so may, may have cognitive uh, problems. Uh, and the environment is able to help them not to forget uh, uh, taking the piece to check whether they are doing well, if they are eating enough or something like that. Or they're suggesting things that they should do and stuff like that. Um, and the same can be done in the hospitals from the point of view of the patients. But we already have that in some way. So there are a lot of monitoring on the patient when you're really bad. Uh, they put already a lot of sensors. They are not integrated into the environment, but in some way you already have something sensing you. Uh, but what is, for example, missing today is something that helps the, the, the work of the operators. So if you take, for example, a nurse, it's very difficult to find some ICT technology that a nurse can use. Nurses are currently, are always running, they should, uh, and they always have something in their hands. They're always doing something with their hands. You cannot say, okay, but if you have a nice application whether you can say whether the patient has a, got the medicine or not. They will never use it. They don't have the two hands free. Because what, either they are, doing, they are giving the pill or they are using the application. If they cannot just look at the application, then putting it down and then take the pill and then forget whether they put them, it doesn't work. Okay, at the ergonomics of the issue. For that specific case, or many other cases, cases similar to that, but this is easier to understand, say that whether either the, the, the room, the environment, the patient, the peers are intelligent, or you cannot just do that with normal technology. Um, transportation is another issue where you can put intelligence into the vehicles. Some vehicles are getting really smart up to now they tend to be very isolated every vehicle is marked by itself but it, you, you, you may have in, you may you may are in line with other hundred vehicles but each of them doesn't speak or communicate with the others which is a pity because they could have a lot of information to to tell you for example if the car in front of you is braking strong well if the car in front of you could tell your car that there's braking, then your car would be faster to brake itself than your own human reflexes before you, 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 you realize that you are risking to, 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 to crash on the, on, on the bumper. Um, or infrastructure in the road, whether there's a, there is information like that. For example, in many cities, uh, they are trying to get uh, traffic information by sensors and, um, beneath the, uh, the asphalt. So there are spies that uh, measure the, the flow of, uh, of cars or, the, or cameras on top of the semaphores or uh, um, public transit. So there's a lot of information that usually 
goes to a central entity that manages them, but this information is not circulated, is not shared, doesn't contribute to create intelligence. Well, the education also has been proposed as a field for ambient intelligence. At the classroom level, the smart classroom or at the campus level, uh, I feel my, this is my personal feeling, which is that education is, so, is mentioned so often because the researchers typically work in universities, so they have an easy way of testing things, or, but not for its importance by itself. The energy, by the, in the other, um, on the other hand, is a very strong driver today. Maybe is economically speaking. Is the reason why people maybe today are considering whether to invest in smart environment, in smart devices, and so on, is in many cases because of the cost of energy. They want to be more efficient. They want to exploit uh, cogeneration of energy by the sun, by the wind, or whatever. And so they need to have some system to manage all of these new technologies that they, they that they want to have to manage efficiently the energy they have. And so these are very, uh, as I said, the, the, the first driver, why people are considering this kind of system. Yeah. Um, and entertainment, of course, is another very, entertainment tends, tends to be, in many cases, the first place where they, where they experiment uh, new technology. Okay, you so say today everything is touch. Who invented the touch, touch technologies? It wasn't Apple with the iPhone 1. You remember the Nintendos? Huh? Uh, it was maybe, maybe 10 years before. The, 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 slogan, the logo of the, of the first Nintendo was the touch generation. Okay, the touch generation when they had five years, 10 years, then they went at, tw at 20 years, they bought an iPhone. But the, the technology went to mainstream after several years where it was already existing in the video game industry. So if, if you want to, uh, for example, the emotive uh, uh, brain uh, reader was sold at the, at the price and was sold to be compatible with, uh, video, with, with game consoles, because there they can sell it, okay? This is what we say, so I, I try to make a very short survey of what you find if you read some papers uh, or, or articles in the, in the topic. Uh, the question that always pops to my mind when I see some examples, some case studies, but okay, but is it intelligence or is it just smart? I mean, smart means something that works well, but works in a deterministic way, not very adaptive or very, uh, say, uh, pre-coded way, not flexible. Uh, do you know this? Nest. These are very nice examples. Well, it's not an ambient intelligence system. It's just one device okay, that pretends to be. But it's a very, it's a, it's a thermostat. Something that you can, you can put in your house to regulate your the temperature. Okay, if you have thermostats in, your, in all of your houses, in all of them, they may be analogic, they may be digital, we may be the weekly programming, and they do a very simple thing. When the temperature inside your room is below a given threshold, they close a the relay and tell your, your heating system, whatever it is, to give more heat, to circulate uh, water or, or air or whatever, okay? Depends on your heating system. They understood the, uh, um, uh, an opportunity to say, okay, well, let's make a thermostat which is intelligent. And uh, Actually, you can go and see, I'm not, I not doing any product, uh, but if you go here, just look at the, the video that you find here, okay? Uh, it gives you an example of something that is uh, very easy to use because people just go and increase or decrease the temperature. But then inside this thermostat, there is uh, a learning algorithm that learns the habits of the people and tries to relate that uh, to the context, to the week, to the day, to the season. 
and it says it's always learning your habits and uh, so it, by night it lowers the temperature by itself and, and so on. It has a set of behaviors that can be personalized without programming. You don't need to fill out a form or whatever. You just use it and then it learns how you use it and then it anticipates your needs. Okay? Uh, and uh, it's beautiful. It's very nice from the design point of view. It's not an ugly stuff, uh, it's very square and big and protruding or whatever. Huh? Uh, it's a design object, which is main, one of the strengths of, the, of this device. Okay, so uh, I think it's a success because it combines uh, the ease of use, the design, and uh, the intelligence in that specific function, of course. It's just a thermostat. Okay? If we could have a full house of devices that are well designed like that, I would appreciate it. There is one limitation, for example, which is that doesn't, you cannot, okay, you cannot interact with that. You can, you, there's of course an app that will reach, uh, by which you, when you are out of home, you can control it, but you cannot build your own application. The, they don't publish an API for which you can program it. Hmm? So it's a bit close as an approach. Many approaches are close. By the way, they got a lot of money from Google for this project. Hmm? This is an independent company that was bought by Google very recently. Okay, as the application area, to, to give some, to try to broaden our mind. Okay, next week we will ask you, propose us something. Try to come up with ideas from different fields. Okay, then we will try to take these ideas and scale they and scale them down to something we can build. But we can build a little piece uh, of, a, of a large vision. Um, and so these are, I'm trying to list here, uh, what are the features that would be necessary for calling a system actually intelligent or intelligent ambient. Uh, what are the characteristics, the features that are in some way implied by the definition of ambient intelligence? We already mentioned some of these, but uh, uh, a lot of uh, literature or papers uh, mention these six uh, objectives. We, we already, some of them, we already mentioned them, okay? It's not new, it's a, it's a systematic way of saying, okay, let me, let's make a checklist of six points. Let's try to score a system or an idea on these six uh, points. Uh, maybe some ideas, some, some systems are stronger in some of these points and less on, in others. But these are the dimensions that should be all of them present in some way. An MEI system should be sensitive, responsive, adaptive, transparent, ubiquitous, and intelligent as much as possible. Well, sensitive and responsive is uh, one way of calling uh, the sense and act uh, phases. Sensible is being able to sense the environment to sense the occupant. It may be trivial, but sensing the occupants is one of the most difficult things to do. How much people are, is there in this room? How many people, sorry. How many people uh, are there in this room? We can count, of course. But uh, uh, an easy, it's, it, it's fundamental now for, 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 um, for many, it's a context information which is very useful. Uh, well, useful for maybe regulating the, the hair circulation. If there is a less people, you don't need to circulate a lot of cubic uh, uh, meters of air because people are breathing less. If you have uh, the full room, and so how can you know? It's an information that we, we can be done to adapt in a more intelligent way the timetable of the schedule of the, of the classes. Each classroom costs a lot of money to build and to maintain. And if you understand that the classrooms are, used, are not used to their full uh, capability, it's better to change. You can save uh, a lot of money if you optimize better the usage of the classroom, for example. Huh? It can, it's not something for the user, but for the system it's very interesting. But we don't have any technology today to give this information in an easy way. It may seem a stupid problem, but there's a solution. 
easy to implement. There, may, there are many, uh, many proposals, uh, many are based on, uh, on computer vision. So a camera that tries to see the faces, uh, but then if you move from here to there, does it recognize that you are the same person or not? Or if some person is hide, hidden behind another, it's, it's not easy. And then it's very costly as a solution. So, uh, and in, in even, even in house, or even recognizing which person. And you cannot ask people in, in your house to wear badges or, uh, or, or tags to recognize themselves. If you are in a building, yes, maybe. To enter into the, into the apartment, I have to, to pass my badge to the, through the reader. But, and so the system might know, may know that I am in. But if two persons enter with my, uh, together with me, it will never know. So, but in my house, it will I will never accept it. Okay. So, uh, even simple things about who is there and how many people are there are very difficult. And then from there we can go on. Oh, what are what, what are they doing? Are they doing well? Uh, where are where are they inside the, the building and so on? So a lot of information that we need to to get. We would like to get. And of course, we need to be able to process this data. Sensitive. Responsive is able to respond to user needs, of course. Responding to user needs in a reactive way, but also in a uh, proactive way, uh, as we said last time. And able to act on the environment. So responding to user needs means uh, taking the decision. I need to close the door. Acting means uh, giving the command for the door to be closed. So there's always a, a point where the decision has been, has been taken and then this information is given to a lower level system, a less intelligent system, to carry on the action. I need temperature to be increased. Okay, I change the, the setting in the heating system. And then it's the heating system who will control all the valves, the pumps, and all the tubes and, and stuff like that. Hmm? It's not the brain, but it's the, the, the execution. Sensing and uh, um, sorry and responsiveness can be um, very simply connected. So whenever a temperature is higher, then do this, then uh, command the heating, or can be connected through an adaptive mechanism, which is what requires the intelligence. So from smart to intelligent means that I, I need to have. Uh, adaptivity in some way. It, doesn't, it shouldn't be like every time I see this, then I do that. It should be something more complex. Otherwise, this, we already have it. Uh, we don't need to do research on that. We already, you can already go and buy an the shelf system that implements uh, a, uh, say a rigid, specific, a, a pre-programmed set of scenarios or automatic uh, uh, behaviors. Adaptive means, uh, first of all, able to infer a context. So understand in which context are we? Are we dining? Are we looking at the television? Are we working? Are we playing? Are we sleeping? Are we giving a class? Without being given this information explicitly. So inferring this information from the, the environment, from the sensing all this environment data, user data, historical data, what happened in the, in the past, in this, uh, trying to find similar situations and then see what the users did in similar situations from external information sources. Okay, it's not cheating if we look at the timetable of the Polytechnico to understand whether we are doing a class right now. It's not cheating, it's valid. It's data which is already structured, which is available, we would, we would uh, we would be stupid not using it or looking at my Google Calendar. Okay. If, if there is a reliable source of information, even if it's completely outside the ambient intelligence system, it can be used. It's very precious having this sort of links from the IT, from the information technology world, all the databases and so on, to the ambient. Hmm? Um, 
maybe you posted on Facebook something very nasty because you had a fight with your colleague uh, and so you go home, you find your home which is warmer with some music, very calmly, because it understood that you posted on Facebook something, so your mood could not be, so you need to soften it. Huh? Wouldn't be, that be nice? Hmm? And, um, okay. Understanding the context and then changing the action depending on the context that has been identified. Hmm? Somebody is calling this part context aware computing. Not so easy, there are some frameworks for doing that, but. And then the other three, the other three are more technical, I would say. Transparent, transparent means uh, aiming at the disappearing computer. The disappearing computer is a very old uh, concept. It was introduced in 1991, so it's 15 years, if you count them by fives. The most profound technology say this research to Weiser, the most profound technology are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life, and we say also objects, until they are indistinguishable from it, from the light. So technology is there, you don't see it. The car is a perfect example. I like it very much. They did an excellent job. I learned to drive uh, some years ago. And they still can drive with the same uh, interface that I used uh, in my early times. You still have three pedals, one gear shift, and uh, but everything has changed. There's nothing in car in today's cars which is equal to with cars 30, 30 years ago or, so, or something like that. Hmm? So uh, technology it disappears. You don't see it. You see it only when it breaks, okay? So they say, oh, we cannot fix it. We need, you need to change the, the control unit. It's only 2,000 euros. And uh, instead of fixing with, the, with your hand. Hmm? Uh, and so uh, I just took some picture, for example, here is nice, it's a mug that can tell you whether your coffee is becoming too, uh, becoming too cold or, uh, or you are drinking, uh, it's, it's nearly finished, so I can maybe order uh, another one or give you information about that. Or some new interfaces, uh, this is for example, a shop interface in which you, inter you don't interact with the computer, you interact directly with the, with the, with the, um, with the mirror or with the glass. Hmm? There's a lot of ideas of... Uh, uh, well, if, if some of you uh, likes uh, science fiction movies, you can find uh, a lot of examples uh, from the, the very first Minority Report, which was the most famous movie in which they, they, they anticipated, uh, let's say, gesture interfaces uh, and uh, uh, 3D interfaces and, uh, um, and um, how to say, uh, augmented reality, okay? Uh, which is something that we are doing today, or we are trying to do today. Of course, it's easy to do that in a, in a movie, and it's more difficult to do that in the in a reality, but there are many ideas or suggestions from that uh, sector. Hmm? The other objective is uh, ubiquitous. Ubiquitous uh, computing, some other people call it pervasive computing. They are fighting uh, with the definitions, uh, which is more... Uh, suitable, but actually means uh, being everywhere. Uh, so, an ambient intelligence, by definition, by ne it needs uh, to have uh, objects that are distributed in different places. The sensors are here, the actuators are there, the user is moving, who knows where it goes, the control system is in a different place, some other information is gathered from a third place, and so on. And usually, they tend to have uh, many information sources, many sensors that be, can be everywhere, and uh, may have, uh, may, they may be able to act uh, in different places, okay? And so, uh, able to be distributed over the ambient and over different people. And okay, it's easy to say, but when you say, I want a sensor that uh, I can install in hundreds, you need something small, cheap, fast, without using too much battery, and uh, a, a lot of, uh, 
it's very difficult for the for the microelectronics uh, industry to come up with devices that can really be used in a pervasive way, you know, ubiquitous way. way. The most important success probably is the sort of RF IDs, so radio frequency IDs, uh, where very small, very cheap, they can be printed, they can be woven, they can be uh, attacked uh, with, with, the, with the glue, and they don't need any, any external energy source to function. They just work on the, on the energy beam that the reader is pushing on them. So, and that uh, uh, it, it's an ingredient which is very important in, in today's system. They're already working, okay? But there's, we are trying always to do uh, something more. And when these devices start to be more intelligent, uh, they need to recognize each other and talk to each other, even if they were not pre-programmed to do that. So you, you should be able to deploy a sensor today and to deploy another sensor in three years, and the older sensor should be able to talk to the new one. Even if when the first one was built and the second one was not even, maybe the company who built the second one didn't even exist. If we don't do that, we are failing for the users. In your house, you can plug something in your wall socket of new. Even maybe your house is 200 years old, or maybe the electrical system is 50 years old, and you're plugging something that was just invented last year. But it works. There are clear interfaces. Okay, it's easy in that case. But we need to do that also. Because otherwise, people will have a lot of devices that don't work together and don't contribute to building one a big system. And of course, the last uh, objective uh, that we want to push that needs, needs to be present in some form, more or less, all of these are not just on-off uh, uh, properties, okay? Is it or isn't it ubiquitous? Is it more or less, each of them? No? We, we should have a bit of everyone but, of course, depending on the system, depending on the technology, it can be more or less. Of course, int intelligence means, uh, okay, incorporating all, uh, or can, or it can use uh, all that comes out from the research in artificial intelligence as a computer science discipline in software. Uh, there's a lot of intelligence also in understanding uh, people the language, for example, understanding voice is not just voice in the, as understanding also the language. Once I understand, once I recognize the words, what do they mean as a sentence? Hmm? And what is the, the, the action that you should do after that sentence? And uh, the intelligence or artificial intelligence is uh, an enabler for achieving content awareness, adaptivity, proactivity, and so on. So in some way, uh, intelligence and, ad and adaptivity are very linked together. You can say that intelligence is the technology that enables the ambient to be adaptive, no? the implementation of adaptive uh, uh, behaviors, something like that, hmm? in a way. Um, okay, I want just to spend the last uh, five minutes or so in trying to have some uh, pictures about uh, the architectures of these systems. It's something that will be developed better during the course, but since we are trying to, to, to give the, the picture at the beginning, um, ambient intelligence requires complex systems. Complex systems are systems in which there are a lot of interactions between components of the systems, and not all the effects of all the interaction may be uh, known in advance, they would be emerging just from the complexity of, of things. They need, it needs a lot of technology and lots of information from computer science, from electronics, and so on. It needs, uh, or in the, in the future, we need to uh, say move from uh, prototypes or examples, like we are doing here, like we will do in the lab, very small examples, but that try to exhibit all or many of these properties that we want, we need in the future to be more industry-like. Uh, industry is producing a lot of devices, but not in this comprehensive way. And that I will show a couple of pictures that probably will uh, fix this idea better. And uh, again, the role of the users should be more as I discussed than the role of technology. Okay. Um, 
I will start from a simple example to understand how, how, how stuff can be put together. This is just a, some pictures of uh, home automation technologies that you can find if you walk around the Polytechnic and know where to look, actually. Um, and this is a picture of some, not all of them, some of the standards that are being used today in home automation technology. So if you go to one house, maybe they can use this kind of protocol. In another place, they can use another one. In another place, see another one. And they are all different. They are all uh, quite incompatible. Even if there are devices that can bridge the two networks and so on, they are uh, backed, uh, pushed by different manufacturers or different groups of industries. And so they are fighting against each other. It's not like computer science when you have Ethernet, you have Wi-Fi, you have 3G, that's it. Hmm? The issue is that here, uh, everything is, is still different. Probably will converge, I don't know. And uh, so there are a lot of different standards, some coming from the field of, of home automation, sorry, home automation, some coming from the fields uh, of more industry or building automation, and some coming from the field of computers or informatics or computer science that are trying to use, uh, there's lots, for example, uh, of Wi-Fi IP cameras that can be deployed. And these are just uh, coming from the, the, all the technology or the protocols are coming from the computer science field. So it's a, it's a, it's a bad uh, situation. And uh, so the users are in some way today in the hands of the manufacturers because there are so many standards, so many technologies, they don't interoperate, they tend to become obsolescent and very quickly and don't trust new universal standards i would say every year pick a manufacturer they say okay we will enter the home automation market with these new lines of products and we have defined a new protocol that we will use today it was samsung two years ago it was google in the middle there was sony that did a similar announcement okay Philips is doing that with their lights and so on. They come up with a line of products and they invent uh, a, a standard, a protocol, a technology for integrating their own products, right? not the other, not the competitor's products. This is not in the interest of the, of the user, of course, and not in the interest of the system integrator. It's in the interest of the manufacturer of devices. Okay? The, the more incompatible it is, the less people will go to the competition, maybe. Um, okay, the picture I will say, oh sorry, I forgot to translate this one. I'll, I will put an updated one. And uh, uh, if, you, if we have just a very simple view in which we have some devices which are in the environment, some application, and some sort of infrastructure that's able to connect the devices with the application, is a simple world. Then the Nest, for example. Is an example of this. You may have the application running on the iPhone or on the servers, you have the infrastructure connecting them with just a wireless connection, and then the devices. But then you imagine a real environment in which you, yeah, you want to have many different applications. You want to control temperature, lighting, audio, video, security, just to speak about simple things in, all, in all automation, of course, even before thinking about intelligence. And then you may have different groups of devices of different technologies that need to work together. So how do we put all of them together? How can we allow different applications to work with different types of devices? Nowadays, what we have is a many, the replication of many of these stacks. One, two, three, four. Each application deploys some devices, is only able to speak and talk to those devices. And the other devices are for the other application. They don't share information. They don't share control. This is how things are built in many cases today. And to come up with the, this problem, to a solution for, for, to this problem, there are two easy and wrong solutions that I try to picture here. One is the, uh, what they call the all-you-can-eat application. So 
you have many different uh, type of devices or whatever so you try to build an application that in some way eats uh, the infrastructure so in this picture they may be separate in this picture you see that the application already knows how to speak to the devices how to manage the devices so this application can go with this device and uh, it's a problem of course because when you want to reuse these devices with another application you can there's no separate entry point for communicating with them there's no infrastructure which is common which can be shared and also managing this application is very difficult because uh, you must have full control over a set of devices that you need to certify to maintain and people cannot use different technology if they become better if, if in two if in two or three years this technology becomes older you need to change a lot of things because a lot of code of software in your application will depend on the fact that these devices work in some specific way and if you change technology you need to restart from the beginning and the other is having the uh, okay a gateway for controlling the device which is very very smart and so is able also to manage the, the infrastructure level yeah, uh, to have a lot okay there is a gateway which is also able to do i don't know data storage and the filtering and then computing and then a lot of other services which is good because uh, people who build these devices sell better components sell something which is more intelligent and so on but then what happens that the application becomes dependent on the features of this device this gateway of this specific product uh, there's not a standard a protocol that says which are the functions that are implemented here what is the api the programming interface here it's one specific device that offers these functions if tomorrow the producer of this device decides not to produce it anymore your application is died is dead sorry cannot be reused in any way because it's too linked to this uh, choice of product not of technology not of protocol not a standard of product you should never be dependent on one specific product because you are putting your success in the hands of one of the choices of one specific manufacturer hmm? and so what we want to achieve is something i already shown this in one of the first slides last time something which is less vertical and more horizontal by layers the environment uh, includes some devices the devices are managed by some middle layer and uh, this middle layer manages all sorts of different groups of devices in a uniform way if possible so that the application can work and are independent as much as possible from the devices if tomorrow this kind of devices will disappear the impact on the application is very little because it's hidden or mediated by the middleware if tomorrow i need one type of new application it's easy to do because none of the devices has been designed with a specific application in mind so decoupling separation loose integration is important to achieve let's say durability of your system or your device so that would be one of the design criteria for creating some architecture which are which okay do the job but also are flexible and extensible in the future okay i stop here so i give you some time to to rest before the next part of the class thank you